You know, first of all, I think it's really exciting to be in this museum. You know, so many of the I live in Chicago, and so many of the museums I go to are in big cities. <laughs> and everything, let's back up, 90% of what I see in all of those big city museums is the same. You know, and here, I mean, upstairs, you could look at my all and a John Stuart Curry in the same view. And for me, that's absolutely fabulous. You understand all these different dynamics. You see how artwork relates. You understand some of the vision of the director of the museum. You understand how it relates to the community. You understand how it has some kind of didactic purposes. And it isn't all you know, best ofs, but it's you know, things that illustrate and demonstrate to students and the community you know, how art functions and what its power can be. I really love good university college museums. This one's exceptional. Um, <clears throat> what I've been doing for the last three years, and I'm having an absolute blast, is teaching an online course to empower visual artists. And, you know, it, it's a lot of demystifying, and I do it by, it's a 12-week program, and I bring in guest experts every Monday night, and we do two live webinars where all the artists in the course who are paying me money to do this <coughs> can ask questions in real time and have a discussion with significant art world people, and you know, it's been an eye-opener for me. I've learned a lot. I've been involved in the art world since 1973. You know, and a lot of it is finding ways to share what I've learned over that period of time. You know, as an aside, one of the things I've noticed is that there's a lot more people who are interested in being mentors than there are people who are interested in being mentees. You know, and a mentor is someone who's willing to show you the ropes, tell you how it worked for them, what worked and what didn't work, and enable you as a young artist or a young person to not have to reinvent the wheel every time, you know, you do something. In Chicago, people have been graduating from the School of the Art Institute for over 100 years. All of those artists say to themselves, should I go to New York or should I stay here or should I go back home? And all of them try and figure it out for themselves as if they were the first person to ever have that issue to deal with. And it's so much better and easier and wiser to ask someone who's had to make that decision before. You ask three people who went to New York, three people who went home, three people who stayed in Chicago how it worked for them, you're going to have a whole lot of information so that you don't have to spend five, six years maybe doing the wrong kind of thing. Um, this talk is about how to succeed in the art world. And I'm totally of the opinion that every single artist can succeed. Everybody. Um, and part of the reason I do this class and do this discussion is because, you know, I think there's lots of problems confronting the United States and the world. And I think, by definition, creatives, artists, and people in the art world have greater access to problem solving than problem creating, and that with more respect given to artists and more empowerment of artists, the whole damn world gets to be a better place. Ultimately, success is about relationships. And you know, what I'm going to say is particularly applicable to visual artists. But I think it's exactly the same thing for every other kind of work, business, endeavor that, other peop that people may undertake. I was interviewed last week and somebody said, do you think it's different for artists than it is for accountants? I said, you know, not so much. You know, I mean, I think it's important that artists be honest and vulnerable and that they pursue their career and their endeavors on a daily basis, pretty much 24 hours a day, whereas an accountant can put on the green cap, right, and the... Um, and the three-piece suit and go to work and push numbers and then come home and put their sweatpants on and be somebody else. You know, for artists, it's more like be yourself all the time, regardless. Um, so I want to talk, so we're going to talk about how it's about relationships and then we're going to come back to that as a conclusion. I believe that for all artists, there are, you know, we, we talk about the art world, but there really isn't that much of an art world. There's much more, a lot of different art villages you know, and you can take a look at these different art villages. The artist must figure out which art village or villages they want to be in and which art village or villages they probably belong in and then try and find a synergy. As an example of villages, you could take Tandem Press. 
as one. You could take Pace Gallery and New York galleries and, and you know, and or other printers as examples of two different kinds of villages. Another village might be working with or through art consultants. The gallery system is another village. Not dealing with galleries is another village. Doing large-scale public sculpture is a, is a village. Doing private commissions is a village. Doing portraiture solely is a village. Doing duck stamps, you know, and hopefully selling your stuff to the United States Post Office. You know, there are lots and lots of different kinds of art villages. Those are all for artists, you know. Then you could throw in being a professor. You could throw in being an arts administrator, working in a museum. You know, a lot of times there's atrophy in terms of people who are making art and they're not make, there's less art being made after five, ten years after you got out of school. But, you know, there's still plenty of other kinds of art activities you can engage in. The point is that there are lots of different art villages. You know, somebody once asked me or said to me, if I could only get past the next obstacle, I will be a success. And I said, there are no obstacles. <laughs> you know, and that's really true except for one thing. The only <laughs> obstacles that exist are the obstacles we put in front of ourselves. You know, there's a lot of artists who are a little bit negative and the art world sucks and everybody's picking on me. BS. You know, this is about the stuff we create and the barriers we put in front of ourselves. There, you know, the, the, the only obstacles that may exist in the art world are the obstacles you put in front of yourself or the lack of knowledge. You know, and that's where the part about mentors come in or, do, you know, this course that I'm teaching, it conveys a ton of knowledge about how the art world operates. That information knowledge is available to everybody who wants to get it. There are different people who are conveying it. There are different ways to experience it. There are different ways to work through the process. You know, it's available in a lot of different kinds of directions. The obstacles, you know, that you, one puts in their own way, you know, we need to confront that. All of us put those obstacles in front of ourselves. Among other things, I'm a TED mentor of TED Fellows, you know, the TED group. And, I, you know, they have sort of like 2,000 people a year apply to be TED Fellows, and they pick like 10 or 12. So these pieces are, people are like, you know, like one out of several hundred. And I work with them, and every single one of them I've worked with so far is insecure. And, you know, it's, it, it fascinates me, because it's sort of like on a level of a MacArthur Prize or grant, you know, the Genius Awards, or getting a Nobel Prize. You know, and I have to believe that if these TED fellows are insecure, so are those folks. And if they're, you know, we all know we're all insecure, right? <clears throat> so probably the point of the matter is that if something, someone says something to you that's positive, you should probably f try and find a way to believe it, as opposed to dismissing it and going, oh no, you know, my socks are dirty, I couldn't be any good. Um, or whatever, right? You know, I mean, maybe when somebody says negative stuff to you, you can dismiss that. But the positive stuff, you know, their perspective, their ob objectivity is probably closer to what the truth is than our own self-awareness. You know, as an artist, I think it's important to be self-aware, but it can, it, can be, it can be challenging, you know, and difficult to have that kind of honesty and openness. Um, I think it's important to know, in my mind, there are three key ingredients to having a successful art career. And I'm reluctant to admit that I think they're in this order. Number one is be distinctive. Let's go out back to the other end. Number three is make good art. I think these other two are more important. Number one is to be distinctive. Be yourself. Be who you are. Be honest. Dig down inside yourself. Reveal who you are. All of us on this planet as human beings are unique. You know, there is nobody that's quite like us. We probably have more than one soulmate, but there's nobody that's, an, you know, identical to who we are, okay? So that if you are yourself, you know, like there's that little quote or sign you see on Facebook, it says, be yourself, everybody else is already taken. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like that. As an artist, you don't really want your work to resemble somebody else's art. If your work looks like, I was walking around the museum, if your work looks like Sam Gilliam's work, you know, and you're doing, doing a good job of getting it out into the world, you're promoting Sam. You know, it, it's not so much about you. You need to find what makes you distinctive from everybody else. And you need to focus on that and expand upon it. 
Number two is that you've got to get your ass in the game. You've got, this is back to the relationships thing. You've got to get engaged. It is no longer sufficient to sit in your studio and expect the world to come to you. I have heard artists say, it's all about the art. If you make good art, opportunities are going to come. You know, that's true, but not so much in that little teeny microcosm. You've got to still give it the opportunity to get seen. Dawood Bay, D-A-W-O-U-D, Bay, B-E-Y, writes a wonderful blog based on a song by Marvin Gaye called What's Going On. So if you Google Marvin, uh, Dawood Bay, What's Going On, way back, I had him on a, I, he was on a panel, but he was the most prepared, and had this list of 10 items of advice for young artists. You know, one of the items that he put in there is associate with people better than yourself. You know, it's sort of like if you want to learn how to play tennis, or, yeah, that's a good enough one. I was going to go to a winter example, but I'll stick with the tennis. Um, you know, you're probably better off playing against someone who has some experience as opposed to a fifth grader who doesn't have experience. Fifth grader with experience might be just fine. But, you know, you, you learn better, you associate better with people who are better than yourself. The other thing you need to do is create opportunities where your work gets seen. If you're making good art and you're getting it out into the world, that number two, hustle, you know, and to get seen, then you're going to start getting some attention. Number three is make good art. You know, and good art for me means it's distinctive. Take a look around. Can't all of us name artists who are doing really, really well monetarily, whose work we think sucks? You know, don't we all know, and maybe we could point at ourselves, artists who are making fabulous work that nobody's paying any attention to? You know, all of this stuff, what makes the art world so wonderful is that all of this stuff is subjective. It's not like it's objective. You know, you can take a look at a baseball team, you know, and you can take, like, or a football team, and you can look at the stats, and you can, you know, you can say that Aaron Rodgers has got a really great arm, he's completing this number of percentages, he has only this number of, per touch, uh, of interceptions and this many touchdowns. You can put it on a graph and you can say he's number two in the whole league, last year he was number one, what a great athlete. And you don't know anything about his personality, except from those ads, and you don't, you know, there's all that other stuff <clears throat> you don't know. The art world is totally different. You know, I mean, you can say this artist has sold this much for this much money, but you go, fine, that doesn't mean I like it. You know, it's about, it's subjective. How people respond to your artwork is an emotional, visceral, personal thing, experience that they have. Okay, so it doesn't mean you need to train so that you can run 100 yards faster than somebody else or jump higher than somebody else. What you need to train to do is to be more yourself. Then it's a question of numbers, getting your artwork out into the world so that more eyeballs see what it is that you're doing. You know, if you can get your art in front of some thousand people, you know, the objective is to find 25, 35 people who will buy your art. And, you know, you don't even, I mean, think about it. Five more decent sales a year as an artist could totally change your life. You know, I'm a big supporter of shopping locally, wherever local happens to be. If I'm buying something from artists who are from my extended community, I'm helping them, I'm putting more money, I'm, you know, I'm enhancing not only my life by the art I've acquired, but their life by, you know, improving the quality of their life, giving them more sale, giving them more confidence, giving them more money that they spend in the community. You know, it all stays, it's, it all sticks around. It's, it's, it's a really nice, you know, feature, I think, of... Um, being able to support yourself individually, you know, locally. So the point is, again, that it's subjective, okay? Different people. You need to show it to people. Nobody's going to, you know, I mean, we've all heard the discussions that sort of go nowhere. This piece is better than that piece. You know, well, okay, prove that to me mathematically or using physics or something quantitative. Can't be done. It's emotional. It's visceral. It's my response as opposed to your response. And if my ego's bigger than yours, I'm going to say I'm right and you're wrong, you know? And if your ego's bigger than mine, I'll probably bow in your general direction. But it's still, you know, totally individual and personal. So you've got to focus on getting your art out into the world. I think it's important to differentiate between vision and strategy. They're two different entities. 
Vision is the stuff that your art is about. Vision is the stuff that makes your life tick. Vision is the stuff that distinguishes you from everybody else. Whether you're an artist or not, we all have our own visions and things we believe in. Okay? Some of that we could even construe to be like politics. Strategy is the other stuff, the stuff that is negotiable. The stuff that influences how you get your strategy out into the world. Do I use hire somebody for public relations? Do I want an art gallery? How big do I make my art? What colors do I use? Do I work square or vertical or horizontal? Do I do rondos, you know, round things? Um, <clears throat> do I, um, what, how do I price it? Do I do prints? Do I do paintings? Do I do dimensional things? What's the relationship between, you know, a perceived relationship between works on paper and paintings? Do I want to mount my paint, paper pieces on canvas? You know, I mean, certainly worked for Rothko to take all of his, you know, a lot of his paper works and stick them on canvas. It add perceived value increases. All of those kinds of things are about strategy. This course I teach is about strategy and how to get your art out into the world and find more success for yourself. I think you need to adjust your strategy to your objectives. Now, I'm trying to teach artists how to succeed, and for a lot of people, one would assume that's money. But that isn't the case for everybody, and I, don't, I want people to be successful on their terms. Some people want to get attention for what they're doing. Some people want to communicate. Some people have enough money. They want to be able to make art and see people enjoy it and appreciate it, and, you know, whatever, so that there's, there's lots of different kinds of objectives that an artist can have. I think you need to know what your objectives are, what is it you want, and then sort of methodically, you know, try things that move you into, you know, a greater proximity to what success is for you. I believe that give or take 20%, 50% of an artist's efforts should be outside of making art. That means 30 to 70% of an artist's time and efforts should be about focusing on their career. That's a lot. You know, and it depends how long it takes you to make art and what the relationship is of yourself to your art, but you know, you need to spend more time doing that. You know, as an advanced idea, and this one, I'm convinced that, the, the, you know, more and more artists can benefit by having business partners. The same way, you know, a corporation would have business partners and people who share the, the artist's intent of seeing success for that artist's team. You know, it's almost like the business partner has a 49% interest. I mean, I think, still think that the artist needs to maintain control and responsibility is a big one for me. You know, even if you're an artist and you have a gallery, I don't think you relinquish all authority and responsibility to the gallery. But because you have a gallery, you should respect them and their input and their ideas and how to hang things and respect them. It's your career, though. You know, you should have that kind of responsibility for your career. And even if you have a business partner, you know, it's not a studio assistant, it's a partner. And because a lot of us, you know, as I said, you know, I, there are no obstacles, but some of us have a real problem doing certain kinds of things, like speaking publicly, or talking about my art, or selling. <clears throat> and maybe it's better to have, you know, to have somebody else who does some of that for us. But that doesn't mean we should relinquish responsibility. I think it's really important that artists apply the creativity that they bring to their artwork also to their career. Those of you in the room who are artists, think about it. You know, maybe you know how many pieces, I'm not, I'm not really looking for the answer, it's a rhetorical, but how many pieces do you have in line that you have some sense of what they're going to be about? You know, maybe three. Maybe you have a series and you know it's going to be 15. But, you know, and maybe that's three years of work. But most of us, or most artists, are looking one, like chess, you know. One move ahead. The good chess players are looking further ahead, two, three more moves. But, you know, most of us, you know, maybe we work on five paintings at a given moment, but we still don't have what I would call the long view, the big picture about what the art's going to be looking like later, because it's a dialogue between you and the art, and it takes that kind of time. But regardless, you are creative. I think what you want to look at in terms of your career is the 10-year picture. 
And I believe that the bigger you dream and the bigger your aspirations are and your expectations, the closer you're going to get to them. You know, so you need to say to yourself, where do I want to be in 10 years? What do I want to accomplish? Would I like to have, you know, a one-person museum show? Would I like to be, you know, I mean, like, Kerry James Marshall is a, a fabulous artist. His intent is to be in all the major history books, art history books. You know, I mean, that's a really nice goal. And you really got to apply yourself to have that kind of focus and endeavor to get that, you know, accomplished. Also, you know, if you're looking at the 10-year picture, you, don't, you can revise this every five minutes. You can revise it every month. I encourage artists to write artist statements. Not so much that they're going to be used or put out there, because when I had a gallery, I didn't really care about it much. I could figure out what I wanted by looking at the art. But I think it really helps the artist focus and figure out what's, you know, where they are at a given moment. And if they look at that artist statement every three to six months, it sort of becomes like a diary or a journal, and you can track your progress. The only point I really want to make here, though, is that you need to apply creativity to your career. Okay? You know, we talked a while ago about how arts, artists would graduate from schools in the Midwest and then try and figure out um, where to take themselves. I think as an artist, it's wise to have a role model or several role models. And these role models don't have to be following the same career path you did. You, you, you don't have to follow their path per se, but you can see what worked for them and what didn't work for them. There's a fabulous book, there's a fabulous movie about, that I just finished recently about Thomas Hart Benton, who you know, was a Midwestern artist who was really not interested in playing to the New York school or playing to the West Coast and was really about the honesty that we in the Midwest take for granted, but you know, that other parts of the world find remarkable or something. You know, and he wasn't very popular on the East Coast during, in New York during his career, but he stuck to his guns. Now, you know, some of that made him bitter, some of it made him too outspoken and too honest. You know, you can look at that and you can say, whoa, what a brilliant move, or oh, that's too bad. Or you can look at Frida Kahlo as an example, you know what I mean? Or you can look at artists who've graduated from the University of Wisconsin and where they've gone and what they've done. You know, they may be closer to home. You know, and another thing is that do not assume that you cannot pick up the phone and call. Uh, Thomas Hart Benton and Frida Kahlo would probably be tough. But you could call somebody from Madison, you know, who graduated here five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, and say, hey... I'm wondering how it worked for you when you did this or that. You know, my experience is as a, if you can get them on the phone, if you can get them to answer an email, they will be really generous with their information and share it. You know, I mean, look at this. All, all of you know that it helps to be a nice person and to give of yourself and to, you know, make somebody else better. It, it feels good. Why wouldn't somebody want to do that for you? They would. Um, I think attitude is really, really important. One of my favorite quotes, somebody once asked George Burns the secret to acting. He said, sincerity. If you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> <laughs> now, the idea is that people want to associate with people who they think are upbeat, positive, successful. I've heard the term in my course, you know, have an a rising trajectory, you know, I kind of like that concept, as opposed to the woe is me, I'm a sad sack, I haven't sold anything in three years, I don't even think I've had a date in ten years, and, you know, my mother doesn't talk to me anymore, and God, I wish I could sell just one work of art. You know, that doesn't get you very excited about spending money with that person, does it? Attitude, you know, have a good attitude. Even if you're not successful today, have an attitude that conveys, my trajectory is rising, I am going to be a success. You should know me, because I'm going to be there, and you're going to say, I knew her, him, I knew her when. Um, per, almost lastly, you know, I mean, I teach all this stuff, and then I see sometimes that people balk. And they balk at getting their art out into the world. And the one thing I say is that if you believe your art, if we want to get more general, if you believe whatever you're doing has any value, but even more so for art, 
Because it's like we're creating babies, you know? We're creating something that's of us, not us, but of us. If you believe that that thing you're creating is any good, you have an obligation to get it out into the world. And again, now back to the relationships. Ultimately, I believe that this is all about relationships. You have very little idea about where good news is going to come from. I love going to things like this because I don't know where good news is going to come from. One of you may change my life. If I don't put myself out there, if I don't take the opportunity to grow that relationship, I'm closing the door on that potential good news. So that it's about relationships, you need to talk. You need to be personable. You need to be affable. You need to have some images of your art on your person, on your phone counts, you know, um, so that you can talk about it. You need to be able to have the elevator pitch, you know, or, you know, where somebody says, well, what does your art look like? Tell me what it is you do. And you need to be able to say that in 20 seconds or less, you know, and to have something to talk about, to, 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 to grow those opportunities and continue the dialogue. That's about it. I'd be glad to take questions for a few minutes. I, um, I don't know. Together we know a lot of stuff. Let's find out. Yes? The question has to do about art school students and debt load. Um, Has it come up? No. You know, most of the people that I'm working with are between 30 and 80. And, I mean, I designed the course initially for art school students, um, and they were too self-motivated, inspired, and, and loaded to want to take on more. And I think by the time they get to be 30, they realize that many, many art schools are not doing a great enough job of teaching artists how to have a career. But you know, they're, they're covering other kinds of things, and that's when people start realizing they need somebody like me. Um, I'm not, I, I don't know how much debt art schools, I mean, what my experience with an awful lot of art school students is, is that they're paying their own way, and they're working, and they're going to school at night, um, and, and they're maintaining that and keeping their debt down. Um, I don't think I have a good answer for you. I think, I think it's, it's a problem and it's challenging. I, I don't think anybody gets thrown in jail for not paying off their loans yet. Um, but they, they accrue interest and it's a problem. Um, you know, I think that trying to be too commercial with your art too soon can totally ruin, you know, your whole body of work and where you're going. I think, I don't know, I've got to think about it more and I don't have a, ready, a good ready answer. I can understand that, yeah. Yes, sir? So since you deal with people that are probably a little further down the road in some sense, um, is there a particular kind of, like, I, I guess I have a blended career, and I'm just wondering if, if a lot of the artists that contact you have that sort of mixed income base and sort of, you know, division of labor during the course of the day that they that's an interesting question. The question is about um, multiple sources of income, some of which are art related and some are not. And I have a couple thoughts. You know, I, I <coughs> when the Swedes, the Vikings, would sail to foreign lands to conduct battle and they'd land on foreign soil, they'd burn their ships. There was no going back. You succeeded or you died. And as an artist, I think if those are your two choices, success is pretty likely. And I've never been in that position where I've had to, you know, burn or not burn my ships. So I share the parable, but I don't know that I endorse it. I also don't know, and I think it's different for different folks, um, whether having an not related art job, and not art, you know what I mean? <laughs> Where you have a job that's not art related, got it. Um, is that better than having, I mean like, um, or is it better to be an art professor and then try and get studio time in, you know, when you're not, when you're not professing, when you're not teaching? Um, and I've seen both 
scenarios succeed, and I've seen both scenarios fail. My concern is that if you are, I mean, I think you've got to be spending at least 20 hours a week making art to, you know, to have a, a chance at a, an art career. You know, I think you could get it down less sometimes, but it should be closer to 20 more often. And that doesn't leave a whole lot of time for going out and so, going to openings, growing your community, you know, talking to an art gallery, walking into an art gallery and going, nice show, thanks. You know, the objective with trying to find a gallery is to get the dealer to ask you questions and to grow a relationship before you say, here, my images do me. You know, you want, you want to grow that relationship. And I don't know that if you're spending half of your time with a straight job, so to speak, that you have enough time to do these other kinds of things, okay? Now, I'm, so I, it depends. You know, and maybe it works, you know, for some people, the autonomy of having a straight job that pays them enough money to make the kind of art they want to make where they don't have to sell it, but they can do what feels good for them is perfect. You know, but for some people who want to make art that makes money, that takes care of them, having this other career gets in the way. So I, I could see it going, you know, either kind of direction. Now, one of the things that I've learned that I thought you might be asking is I've always, for years, maintained that it's important to create a singular body of work and to work in paragraphs and chapters and to have sequential bodies of work. And I was doing a webinar a few months ago with Jason Middlebrook, and Jason said, no, Paul, that's old school. And he said, it's much more important to be an interesting artist. And I changed my mind. So I think that to be an interesting it's artist. What? It's important, more important to be what? Interesting. Because the two are mutually exclusive? No. But I mean, a lot of people want to be able to make you know, photographs and paintings, or different kinds of directions, or abstract images and something that's kind of narrative. And um, I would have argued that that wasn't so wise. And at this point, I would say, you know, as long as you are interesting and you can, you know, promote and focus on who you are and put yourself out there, it's okay to go either, more than one direction simultaneously. Yeah. What's your opinion on the future of teaching art, and what do you think about current graduate students who are pursuing a career in teaching? I get in trouble for this answer. I'm going to try and say it well. I used, I mean, here I am teaching in this course, and I used to long ago be a teacher. And I feel like if you want to teach gangbusters, do it and do it well. If you are teaching out of necessity, don't do it. You mean, the necessity being, this is the only thing I can make money at. You know, I mean, if, if the necessity is I love teaching, I want to do it, it's necessary for me to do that, that's great. But I don't think people should teach if they don't want to teach. I think they should be making art and focusing on that. I think it's frequently difficult to teach and deal with all those aesthetics and conveying information <coughs> that's of a general knowledge and then go back into the studio and focus singularly on your own particular vision. I think that's challenging. Okay. What about the future of teaching art? You know, I don't know. I find that so many art schools are business factories. And they are just as much a business as IBM. And they pontificate about philosophy that I frequently find irrelevant and that doesn't deal with students coming from themselves and knowing who they are. I feel like offering a doctorate in studio art is absurd, um, and there are schools in the world that are doing that. Um, I find that just a way to make money, to keep students around longer, and I don't believe that it makes them a better artist. You know, the question you're not asking I th is, should I go to graduate school, uh, arts graduate school? And my sense is, it's a, if you can afford it, it's a great place and time to focus on your own art without worrying too much about the debt that you're going to incur and you know, being able to just dive into yourself and your art and grow your community. That's really important. But if you're not doing those two things, the art graduate, you know, a master's degree in art isn't very valuable. And um, 
I don't find it particularly necessary. I don't think, unless you're going to be teaching many people, of all the art dealers that I've spoken to, and myself included, that I didn't care and they don't care if their artists do or don't have a master's degree. You know, under 10% care. No, I've got to pick somebody else back there. Similar sort of question. I've seen a lot of MFAs produce stuff that I think is frankly direct. I've seen other people without a formal education produce very fine art. Sometimes after years of studying, painting, and thinking, and visiting galleries, etc. How important do you think an actual formal art education is? Not. I think it depends on the person. I just finished reading this fabulous article in Wired magazine about a college, maybe even high school dropout, who's just design, invented, designed, and sailed the world's fastest sailboat. He got the thing up to, in like a 30 mile an hour breeze, the sailboat went 75 miles an hour. You know, and nobody previously had ever gone over 50 knots. And, you know, it just came from tinkering in the backyard for his whole life, you know, and being on the beach and playing with water and stuff like that. I mean, you know, so much of what makes an artist significant is their life experiences, more so than their formal education. And to an extent, I think, I fear, a formal education reduces life experiences. I'm going to go back to Frida Kahlo. What would have happened to her art career if she'd never been in a uh, trolley bus accident that drove the railing through her pelvis and, you know, prevented her from ever having children and having to be, you know, have so many surgeries? How different would her life have been if she had just grown up a happy little Mexican kid? You know, it's impossible to know. But a lot of it comes from those powerful life experiences. Yeah? Um, I used to really enjoy coming to your gallery. Thank you. And um, why did you not continue? And the second half of my question is, what do you think the future of galleries is uh, for artists? In to a large extent, I, I think I outgrew my audience. I got really interested in art that plugged in, and new media, and computers, and video art, and things like that. And so like in 2002, I started showing a fair amount of that stuff, and there was way too many people that came in the gallery and said, Paul, great show, where's the art? <laughs> And, you know, and it was really hard to sell, you know, like DVDs and at that time, and you'd have to sell a whole projection system or this flat screen, etc. Sell things to museums. I go, what if DVDs aren't going to be around? We'd rather have this on a hard drive. You know, so you'd make that, but there was an awful lot of, there was too much educating going on. And, you know, the people's art I could sell, I didn't love as much as the people's art I couldn't sell. So it became a problem for me, and I'd been doing it long enough. I don't know what the future of galleries is. I think it's getting more polarized. I think more and more artists, many artists don't need galleries. You know, because of the internet, they can communicate and have correspondence and grow their own audience. You know, but if an artist wants to get pretty far in their career, I think they do need a gallery. You know, you probably want an art gallery that shows in art fairs, so that, because at art fairs, there's more curators who are going to see your work than, you know, in 10 years of having the art just in your studio. If curators are going to see it, you're going to have more opportunity for museum exposure, you know, which is, I think, what a lot of artists are really after, and they feel like that, you know, is a stamp of approval on their career and, and stands to augment that. So I think at the higher end, you're definitely going to have galleries. I think the way galleries work on the lower end or the middle end and representing artists is probably going to change. You're going to have you know, more relationships, for lack of a better term, of expediency, where I'll do this show, I'll work with your art for six months. After that, our relationship is over, but we can renew it if we want to. I mean, I think a lot of this is attributable to the influence of the Internet. Anybody else? Well, cool. I've enjoyed talking to you. I appreciate your questions. Thank you all very much. <laughs>